Good morning, and welcome to the Lord's house for worship today. It's good to see everyone in person. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome those viewing today via the web stream, and we ask God's blessings to be upon you all as well. Just a few things quickly by way of announcement. Please take note of your inserts. One is your Stepping Stones Notes insert that has today's sermon text, a place to take notes, and a few reflections related to today's message on the back side. You will also find a full page insert when you fold it out. This is from Original Free Will Baptist International. This is Telethon Month for Foreign Missions, so we will have a different insert along these lines each of the Sundays of this month to please be in prayer. It's a prayerful reminder of our missions program and the men and women who are involved in the work that takes place in so many different parts of our world. We pray for their safety and certainly the hard work that they're doing as they share the gospel in a variety of different settings. Keep in mind tonight is our quarterly conference here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. As you leave worship today, you will receive a copy of the financial report that you can review in preparation for tonight's meeting. This week we have our Wednesday schedule. We also have our Night of Hope, a special time of worship coming up in a few weeks. We are making preparations for a baptismal service in the coming weeks, so please let either me or Marcy know if you or a young person would like to be baptized so that we can sit down and talk with them. Also, if you have not, well, it's kind of late to pick up a purple armband for the Lenten season. There are a few of the Lenten devotionals available in the Narthex. I think there were about four or five back there and one or two copies in the conference room. But unfortunately, the purple armbands with the crown of thorns uh, have given out already. So I apologize for that. Um, I hope that your Lent has started off well. I don't know what your Lenten discipline is for this year, what you're doing or what you have given up. That's it's not for me to know, but I definitely hope and pray that that's beneficial as you seek to grow in your faith over these next 40 days. Marcy? We are planning to get started on our Wednesday, um, return to our Wednesday after school program uh, and our Wednesday youth activities um, I can't give a date for sure uh, but it may be next month um, but we are still seeking some more volunteers um, especially for the after-school program and some assistance for Sally and I for the Wednesday evenings um, so if anyone uh, is willing to work with our after-school program especially if you would please let me know um, 
the kids really want to return and we can't um, we can't have them to return without having some help from adults um, camp I have camp forms camp will be at Camp Vandermeer from June 26 Kelly help me out to the 30th uh, we'll leave on Sunday afternoon and return on Thursday night um, we are asking for a $25 deposit um, from all the kids it is you can go if you have completed without a parent if you have completed third grade to 12th grade um, if you have not completed one of those grades then you have to have a parent to attend with you um, so anyone who would like a camp form and more information please let me know as soon as possible so we can get those deposits in and get those forms in um, and I can get you more information one final announcement, a brand new announcement. I believe I shared this on the phone tree. The Senior Adventures Group will be going to the Easter show at the Rudy Theater mm -hmm. coming up in a few weeks. So if you would like to go, you see the ticket information in your bulletin, please be sure to see either Diane or Charlie to reserve your spot. At this time, let us now prepare our hearts and our minds as we worship God together. <laughs> stand and join us in our responsive call to worship. Seek the Lord in this season of reflection and preparation. We are here, here to, to seek, seek the, the Lord, Lord and, and his, his favor. favor. Open your eyes, ears, and hearts. The Lord is near those who love him and are called by his name. We, we are, are here, here to, to worship and, and praise the Lord whom we love. Let us seek and praise the Lord our God this day. Praise the Lord. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. You may be seated.
lesson this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 25 through 32 Ephesians chapter 4 25 through 32 so then putting away falsehood let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors for we are members of one another be angry but do not sin do not let the Sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked for a seal with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be unto God. God. We go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. I call your attention to the back portion of the bulletin. You'll see many names reflected there within our church family and community in need of prayer. 
Are there other names that you would have us to lift up this morning? Perhaps through uplifted hands. God sees each and every heart, and God understands the depths of our needs. Would you bow with me for a time of prayer? Lord, in this season of Lent, we are challenged in so many different ways. First and foremost, we remember that we are human, and this life is not the fullness of life. We know that we are sinful individuals who fall short of your glory each and every day. And Lord, as a people who were fallen, we know that we have need of forgiveness. And that's not a once-in-a-lifetime experience, Lord. It's every day that we must fall before your presence and confess our sins and our need of forgiveness. Lord, in this season of Lent, we're also challenged to give up something, to be sacrificial for the span of the 40 days so that we might reflect upon the sacrifice that you gave at Calvary. But Lord, so often we give things up for the span of time and then we pick them back up after Easter. But Lord, there are many things in our lives that need to be relinquished to your Lordship permanently. We have certain attitudes, habits, Sins that we harbor on the inside that hinder us from growing in Christ. Lord, break us of those sinful habits. Convict us when we go astray. Forgive us, Lord, for the many times and ways that we do not behave in Christ like ways. Lord, today we thank you for this season of worship where we can come as your people and in a spirit of community, we can worship you in both spirit and in truth. Lord, we know there are many people around this world who do not enjoy this freedom. But Lord, they gather week after week with passion and enthusiasm, whether it be in basements or caves or some other hidden location. They give you more loyalty and devotion than we do when we come together each week. Forgive us, Lord, for our hollow and insincere acts of worship. Return us, Lord, to the heart of worship, where we worship you not just in word, but also in deed, by how we live our days. Lord, today we come with so many names and needs that are pressing upon our hearts. We know many in this church family and community who are hurting. Some continue hospitalizations. Some families are dealing with end-of-life issues. Other families are grieving at the passing of loved ones. Lord, you know these needs. You're well aware of our concerns even before we cry out in prayer. But how good it is when we can come and shoulder these burdens of life together. Lord, hear the prayers of your servants. And have your way and do your will in our lives and in these situations as only you can. Working things out for our good and your ultimate glory. Now, Lord, continue with us in this season of worship and be with us when we leave this sanctuary and we go back out into the world this afternoon and in the days to come that we might be hands and feet of Christ to everyone we meet everywhere we go in the journey ahead. Lord, this prayer we lift up in your Son's most precious and holy name.
Please stand and join me in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God, in this season of penitence, prayer, fasting, and reflection on the ministry of Jesus, we confess our desperate need for your grace. The sorrow from our sins is overwhelming. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as we have loved ourselves. We have lived lives of greed and consumption while others have gone without. Forgive us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. Raise us anew so that we may learn to love you and our neighbors according to the gospel of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and the children may come with me to Junior Church. Our sermon text for today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. For the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at the theme of giving up. With all the encouraging words that I preached from Nehemiah over the last couple of months, you're probably thinking, well, that sounds a little bit hypocritical. I thought we needed to dig in and to focus and have a good attitude in the midst of difficult circumstances. Well, that's true. And I still believe that to be the case even in our present world and even as we begin this Lenten season. But I also would like to challenge us to give up a few things. For some of us over these 40 days, it may be one of our favorite soft drinks. It could be meat. It could be a favorite dish that you enjoy cooking or a restaurant you like to go to. Maybe it's your favorite candy, a chocolate bar. As I've said before of the Lenten season, there's not exactly an exact science to it. There's not a right way or a wrong way to observe Lent. In fact, you don't even have to give up anything for Lent. There are many within the Christian faith who will add something, particularly a spiritual discipline, to help nurture and grow their faith from within. It might be additional prayer. It might be scripture reading. It might be a period of meditation, journaling. I've heard so many people practice a number of disciplines over the years. But as I prayed a moment ago, and I want to challenge us over these coming weeks, may we also be mindful of those other things. Things that are more serious to our lives than chocolate. Things in our lives that are much more important than soft drinks. At least after the 40 days of Lent, I can pick this back up and it's probably not going to affect me too much unless I need to back down my intake of caffeine. And if I have some issues with blood sugar or my general diet, this is probably not the healthiest thing for me to eat, to snack on. But at least if I pick it back up after the season of Lent, it's not going to destroy me spiritually. You see, brothers and sisters, we have other things that are beyond chocolate and soft drinks and meat that are weighing us down, that are pulling us away in our fellowship with God, that are impacting our relationship with our fellow believers, that are impacting our worship and the growth that we're called to do in Jesus Christ. 
It's going to be our challenge over these coming weeks is to consider some of the vices. Some people would call them cardinal sins or deadly sins that impact who we are, what we believe, and also who we are becoming or not becoming for the sake of the gospel of Christ. Those aren't exactly easy topics. They're not the most flattering of discussions especially when we look at our world today but they are important because until God roots out some of those attitudes those practices it's going to be difficult for us to be faithfully individually as Christians and also effective as the body of Christ today we begin with the first of those cardinal sins as we look at Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, referring to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to, 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 store, to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. Brothers and sisters, may God add a blessing to this the reading, hearing, understanding, and living of these words for our days. Amen. Greed, for a lack of a better word, is good. Now before you get up and walk out, before you begin throwing things at me in protest, just hear me out, let me explain. Those words are taken from the 1987 film, Wall Street. The film centers upon a couple of main characters, but really the, the prominent one is a man by the name of Bud Fox. Bud is an up-and-coming stockbroker. He's trying his best to learn the ropes to make a name for himself there on Wall Street. And in an effort to try to up his game, he enlists the services of one of his all-time heroes, a man by the name of Gordon Gecko. Now, Gordon Gecko's been around Wall Street for a while. He's the kind of individual that we would describe as cutthroat, willing to do practically anything to get the job done, to make another dollar. He buys up companies, he divides up those companies, and then he sells them off for enormous profits. In the story, there's a meeting that takes place with the shareholders of a certain paper company. And in that shareholder meeting, Gecko begins to talk about different things, and according to Gecko, quote, greed captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. Gecko then goes on to compare the United States to a malfunctioning co corporation that greed could still save. 
don't know about you, but I don't think Jesus would go along with that logic, especially in light of today's parable. Do you? I don't believe he would agree with Gecko for even a moment. But I do think he would agree that Gecko's attitude in the movie Wall Street reflects the attitudes of many individuals in our world today. It's nothing new, this thing that we call greed. But when we think about those words of Gecko, salvation, the upward mobility of humanity, greed is actually doing something good in the world. If that was the case, then we ought to have enough healing power. We ought to have enough strength to last for an eternity. If that is what greed is, and that's how greed operates in our world today, but we're going to find, according to Jesus, that is simply not the case. But when you think about greed, it's everywhere. It's overseas. It's right here at home. It's on both sides of the political aisle. It's in our families, and if we're not careful, it can even be right here in our hearts as believers. Notice I said, if we're not careful because it happens pastor and author Timothy Keller has recalled an experience in his book Counterfeit Gods he says some years ago I was doing a multi-part series of talks on the seven deadly sins at a men's prayer breakfast for several weekends in a row my wife told me I bet the week that you deal with greed will be the lowest attendance and she was right People packed out to hear about lust and wrath and even for pride, but nobody thinks they are greedy. As a pastor, I've had people to come to me and confess that they struggle with almost every kind of sin. Almost. I can't recall anyone ever coming to me and saying, I spend too much money on myself. I think my greedy lust for money is harming my family, my soul, and people around me. You see, greed hides itself from the victim. The money God's method of operation includes blindness to your own heart. There's a lot of blindness in our world today, would you agree? Plenty of greed to go around, but nobody likes to think of themselves as being greedy. We think of our lives as being kind-hearted and generous and willing to go above and beyond to help, but there's always that teeny tiny part of our lives that is not fully surrendered to the will of God. Some people call this problem a cardinal sin, but it's been around, whatever you call it, since the beginning of time. When you go back to the very earliest portions of Scripture, you find that insatiable desire for more, whether it's money or power or pride or prestige, and it continues throughout the witness of Scripture. People assume if I have this or that then my life will be complete I'll be content I won't have any worries or anxieties in my life if I have just one more certain something I'm reminded of the words of Calvin Miller he was a former professor at Samford University he wrote a work very similar to John Milton's Paradise Lost entitled Requiem for Love and in the introduction to one of those chapters he says the following a beggar asked a millionaire how many more dollars would it take to make you truly happy the millionaire reaching his gnarled hand into the beggar's cup replied only one more 
The problem is only one more never works, does it? It always becomes a matter of the next one and then the one after that. Jesus knew that was true. He knew it was so true to the point that when you read many of the things that Jesus teaches, specifically of the kingdom of God and his parables, he speaks about how the things we have influence people for good or for ill. Check it out sometime. Go through and read the parables of Jesus, and more times than not, they're going to be related to the subject of stuff what we have and it certainly poses the question do we have the stuff that we possess or does that stuff possess us it's a hard question for our world today because we're driven in a world of stuff we're driven with an attitude of the more the merrier. He who dies with the most toys wins. You've heard all of those arguments over the years. But to go back to that statement earlier, none of us, not a one, likes to think that we have a problem with greed. In the passage before us, Jesus was put on the spot. A man cried out from the audience that day, Rabbi, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family property up with me. There is no, hey Jesus, it's good to see you. I've always wanted to meet you. There's no request, Jesus, I've got a concern. Can you help me out? Rather, this is a demand. It's a case of Jesus being told of what Jesus ought to do in these circumstances. Now, what this man was doing was not illegal. It wasn't anything uncommon in that day and time. For if you had a problem, it was perfectly natural and acceptable to go and seek out the services of a well-respected rabbi or if you needed an important decision made, you needed a judgment brought down on something, you might seek out such a teacher. And let's be honest, who better? The teacher of all teachers. The one who was so much more powerful, that much more authoritative than any of the other teachers of that day and time. The Son of God, why not ask Him what He would do? Or better yet, go ahead and get him to do it for you. Jesus knew the situation. Jesus knew exactly what this young man was speaking of. And I say young man because he would have been in a situation to receive a portion of his family's property, specifically the father's ownings. Now, according to the law, a double portion would go to the oldest son and a smaller portion to the younger. But apparently this brother is not upholding his end of the deal. You read of in Deuteronomy 21, Numbers 27, and other places that there was a proper way to break up one's personal belongings to family upon one's death. But maybe this young man didn't like what the brother was doing, how he was handling the business affairs of father's estate. Maybe the man was impatient, as we so often are. Go ahead, God, tell him. Make it happen. I want what I want. But regardless of this man's motivation, his attitude, his demands... Jesus wasn't about to get in the middle of it. This was not going to be people's court with Judge Jesus. Jesus, fix the problem. Jesus, I want my money. You know the kind of situation. 
I've often said of families during times of death that it can bring out either the best or the worst in family members because everybody feels entitled to something before the person can even die they go around and sit down with the family and they begin to label off who gets what when the time comes and forbid anybody gets something that has somebody else's name on it as I said it's a part of the human nature we want what we want when we want it but Jesus saw through all of that he saw through the young man's greed and impatience. He saw through his request, his demand of Jesus. He saw exactly what was going on. And even though he doesn't answer the man outright and directly, he does answer the man in a very different way. He poses a question, Who appointed me to be the judge in these circumstances? I'm not getting in the middle of family bickering. But one thing that I will do is I'll tell you a parable. I'll tell you a story. And that was one of the masterful things that Jesus so often did. Instead of answering people's questions, instead of teaching them do A, B, C, and D, he would tell them a story, a powerful story, a parable that would get them looking at their present situation and allow them to think their way through whatever it was they were battling. The particular parable that's before us has become known as the parable of the rich fool or the parable of the rich farmer. I've always had a sweet spot for farmers and farming, farm equipment. Maybe that's a part of the reason I like when Jesus uses farmers and sowing seed and things like that in his parables. But all of that aside, we're told of a particular man who sowed, who worked hard, and was successful at the end of the growing season. Upon harvesting his crops, he was overwhelmed. He had not just done good, he had done real good, we might say, in our world today. He had the diligence, the determination, and the payoff was there. It was rewarding, it was beyond rewarding. Overwhelmed by his circumstances, the man began to wonder, what do I need to do? Where am I going to put all of this grain that I have that's extra? Now, I want us to note one thing in life. Success is not a sin. It's not. Doing well in life Making a name for ourselves is not a sin. The sin comes when we pose that question, what will I do? What will we do? How we answer that question will determine not only the next steps, but it will say a whole lot about our heart, our mind, our attitude, our convictions in this life. What does the man in the parable do? First and foremost, he never acknowledges God as the source of his blessings. He begins to think, I know what I will do. He has this conversation with himself. And that's something that's common throughout Luke's gospel where an individual will think things out loud and have this conversation, this dialogue to try to make sense of a certain scenario. I know what I'll do. First of all, I'm going to build some bigger buildings, some better barns. Then I'm going to store all of that stuff, all of that extra that I've got. I'm going to make a nice nest egg, we might call it. Oh, and then once everything is safe and secure, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to live in the lap of luxury. When you get a moment, I want you to read that parable again and count how many times... The farmer uses the word I. 
I believe that's one of the biggest problems in our world today. The letter I. The first person singular pronoun for referring to ourselves. He had a plan. He had been blessed with all of this stuff. So he was going to keep all of this stuff safe and sound for himself. He had made himself. He was going to enjoy it himself. But what does God say? The man has this dialogue with himself. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to eat, drink, and be happy all the days of my life. But rather than commending this man, boy, way to work hard. That's how you get stuff. Get out there and really endure and persevere. There are no compliments from God to this man. What does the passage say? God looked at the man and said, You fool! Now that's not exactly a term of endearment, is it? You fool! That's a strong word. You fool! What was it that made the man a fool? Well, one thing, his desire for more things essentially numbed him to the needs of other people. Another, his attempt to control what he had led to a loss of control on his part. And his pursuit, finally, of the present situation ignored the possibilities of the future. The man was living for the moment, right here, right now. No regard for anybody else. No regard even for God. Essentially, he was setting himself up to be God for himself. But it's not a solid form of living. In fact, we might call it a shallow, even short-lived form of existence. That's the gist of the parable. The man may have been successful, but it was all going to come to naught. He may have built bigger buildings. He may have saved grain for himself, but he was not thinking about things from an eternal perspective. But this parable reminds us that the stuff of this life is here but for a moment. And it's gone just as quickly. Unfortunately, greed creates hell in this life for some people. And it leads to hell in the next life for others. I pose the question, where do we want to be found? In the present moment, or are we thinking about things from an eternal perspective? I go back to the words of Gordon Gecko in my introduction. They may speak of the possibility of salvation or the advancement of society through greed. But I believe the words of Jesus teach us otherwise. What does it profit a person to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his or her own soul. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Our hymn of commitment today will be provided to us by Sandra and Yvonne. As they come forth to sing, will we respond to the leadership of God's Spirit? If you've never accepted Christ and experienced the waters of believer's baptism, will you come today? Today, this very moment, can be your time of experiencing God's love and grace in your own life. Maybe you would like to come and recommit your life to following Christ, to being the disciple that God wants for you to be. Perhaps there are needs, burdens that are weighing upon you and your family or even thanksgivings that you would like to come and celebrate with your Heavenly Father. 
No matter the need, no matter the condition of your heart, this altar is open. Will we respond as God's Spirit is speaking? just have to forgive us little folks <laughs> our memory is not too good <clears throat> sister is no stranger to the Little Rock Church family. Becky and Dave have been coming for, I was going to say, been about three. It was before the pandemic, so at least three, maybe going on four years now. But Becky Howell comes wishing to unite with the Little Rock Church family. What are the wishes of this congregation? Does that meet with a second? All right, lots of seconds and thirds out there, so that sounds pretty good. All right, on a count of three, instead of the traditional eyes and nose and all that business-like terminology, I want you to welcome Becky. I say and welcome Becky. One, two, three. Welcome, Becky. Welcome, indeed. And we welcome you to the continued service of the Lord here at Little Rock Original Free Will Baptist Church. I'm going to invite Becky to join me in the narthex. I know you'll want to extend a hand or fist bump of fellowship as she unites with our congregation. Would you stand for our benediction and the blessing of this week's offering? Would you go ahead? Heavenly Father, we are so truly thankful for the gift of this day, for the fellowship that we've been able to share in, and for the challenge from your holy word. I ask, Lord, that you would be with my sisters and brothers as they leave this place of worship and they go back out into the world to be your hands and feet this week. Lord, give them strength, give them boldness, give them courage to be the servants that you would have them to be wherever they go in the hours and the days to come. Father, we also ask that your hand of blessing would reach down and touch this offering, that it might be multiplied for the ongoing ministry of your kingdom here upon earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go in peace. <laughs>